was given this topic. So first of all, let me, let me give you a little bit of my background. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Stanford. Uh, I spend time uh, as an inventor. I have a number of companies I work with and companies I've started. But I, I, my real passion is actually the educational process of innovation. So uh, I'm very fortunate to now run a fellowship program and graduate course program at Stanford that uh, Haim mentioned, uh, where we actually try and teach the process of medical innovation, uh, particularly applied to medical technology. Um, obviously, I want to uh, thank uh, Haim and Paul Iazo and, and Dr. Bayard for the uh, introduction and, and for the invitation to present. So this is the topic I was given. Um, how to determine if a new device is needed. So this is one way we can kind of look at whether uh, you actually have something uh, that you think is worthwhile and should, whether it should go forward. Another way we could look at that is, really, do I have a good idea? Uh, in other words, is this thing I think I have that might be usable, how do I apply it, how do I find out whether it's actually going to have a chance of going forward? The more important question probably is this one, which is, should I spend the next five to seven years and a lot of money pursuing my idea? And that's probably one of the more difficult decisions to make. I spend time on this every day with uh, fellows and other inventors, asking them all the time, are you ready to pull out your credit card? So if you're ready to pull out your credit card, uh, to take note of some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Because at the end of the day, uh, investors don't invest in things that you're not willing to invest to as well. Okay? So you're going to put a lot of sweat and probably a little bit of money, at least as a minimum. Um, I've never seen a project that went forward that uh, an inventor or a group did not have to put something into. Your willingness to put your heart, your sweat, and usually some amount of money into something is usually a signal to them that there's something that's worthwhile. So I don't have any disclosures to go through here. So what do these two people have in common? So on the left, I'm very fortunate to know both of them. Tom Fogarty on the left, very famous cardiac surgeon who's probably one of the most prolific inventors. He's in the Inventors Hall of Fame with Thomas Edison and a number of other great inventors in the world. The guy on the right, John Simpson, who invented a really over-the-wire balloon angioplasty. What do these two people share? Well, they came up with a process that they approached to become not just what I say is one-hit wonders, um, guys that, that did great things and then went away, um, but serial entrepreneurs. They've taken numbers of very successful ideas and technologies forward and done it in a serial way, which has really changed the way we practice cardiovascular medicine. And that's really what your goal should be. Uh, you may have a good idea, but if you take this back in a process, what you want to come up with is something learned so you can actually repeat it over and over again. Um, I think, as uh, Dr. Lotan said, we've all learned the hard way. You will learn the hard way. You will forget something. There's something you won't do well the first time, second time for me, fifth or sixth time, which is kind of the school of hard knocks. For an IP, some kind of business strategy issue, something you learn. So one of the important things I'm going to come to in a few minutes is do not be afraid to fail. Okay? You're going to fail a lot. And when you fail, you want to fail fast and you want to fail often. And I'm going to come back to that as an important principle when it comes to, to looking at projects and prototyping and the iterative process of working on an opportunity. So what you want to do is someday be one of these guys and you're very capable of it. So um, this is a, a slide I borrowed from a colleague at Stanford, which I think hopefully lays out what many of us who spend some time in academia uh, illustrate, which is on the left is basic discovery. These great ideas that are coming out of these basic science labs. And on the right is something like Medtronic, a product coming out. But no one really spends the time um, really in the process teaching you real world translation. Not translation that comes out of Stanford, which is some translational research paper that may have a clinical application in 20 years. But real translation, getting things to patients. And that's what the bottom, bottom line on today we're going to be talking about is how do you get solutions for patients? And that is the most important thing. Now, you're going to hear a lot about intellectual property. You're going to hear a lot about companies. You're going to hear a lot about the process itself. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get uh, new technologies, new solutions for patients to really alter uh, medical care, to change the way that patients are taken care of. And you can do that. Uh, a colleague shared this slide with you, Tom Preble. I kind of laid out, I, I think I should have been more explicit here in step two. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to provide um, some experience for those of us who've, uh, who've actually failed many, many times uh, who teach this that there is a step-by-step -step process you can do that gives you a higher chance of being successful. It doesn't give you a 100% chance of being successful, um, probably not even close to that, but a much higher chance of being successful along the way. So the idea is we can give you a fish or we can teach you to fish. By teaching you to fish, you can do this and hopefully become that serial entrepreneur who actually can take things forward. Um, and entrepreneurism, by the way, isn't just for the individual. 
um, innovation in entrepreneurism are for companies or for other air processes, but the idea is to get something new to patient care. So, great ideas. What's the difference between invention and innovation? So everybody's had a great idea in the shower, we have this commercial uh, in the United States at least that says, you know, the invention process, it's spontaneous, it is basically priceless. Okay, so uh, everyone's had a good idea in the shower. The question is, is it really a good idea and should I take it forward? And how do I convert that good idea, that, that kind of spontaneous thought process, which is in essence an invention to innovation? And it's all about the application of such an idea. So uh, as I mentioned, we have broken this down in a process at Stanford into three major topics, identify, invent, and implement. Um, I wanna make sure I highlight that, that these are three very different phases. Um, I run a, a fellowship program at Stanford with 20 fellows each year. The identification process, we do not let our fellows invent for four and a half months. They're not allowed to write anything down and invent anything. And that probably is a big shocker to everyone here in the room here who thinks that's crazy. But the idea is to spend so much time appreciating clinical problems that you find areas um, of innovation, areas that need new technologies, new solutions, but we don't really care what the solutions are. We just want to find something to change the care of a particular problem. And we're going to talk a lot about how to go through that process. The invention process, by the way, is not just that spontaneous uh, idea in the shower. It's the process of creating formally brainstorming, iterative uh, cycles of prototyping, taking that back and taking it to the customer and testing it out and making new iterative improvements in that step. And really, it's not about implementation. There's nothing that you can learn out of a textbook. There's nothing you can learn in the, even today that's going to tell you about implementation. Implementation needs to be done by doing it. Um, but what we can do is set you up for a process for learning the steps of preparing yourself for implementation. How to write a business plan. What are the important principles in a business plan? And how do you think about the strategies and think that are important for planning for implementation? How I was given the topic of, well, what if I have an idea? Okay, how do I do this? And I think we're gonna take this approach slightly different and modify that, which is this. I've invented something. I had an idea in the shower. The question is, is it worthwhile or not? And so you can still apply the same kind of screen, the same way, um, by validating whether the idea is worthwhile and going back and looking at the clinical problem. Um, and if we don't wanna be technology push, um, there are technologies out that have been very successful. Well, let's just put our technology, write it down in our notebook, put it off this side and go ask ourselves, do we want to spend the next five to seven years and a lot of money um, actually taking a technology forward? And then how do we apply that to implementation? So again, this is a needs-driven process. The idea is to move from the clinical need to the invention. Now you may have already have an idea of the invention. Again, write it in your notebook, sign it, have somebody else sign it, close it off and put it to the side. I've seen lots of people bring me inventions to say, that, is, this, is this a good idea? Is this invention worthwhile? I think I'm gonna file a provisional patent. And the answer is, just to answer everyone's question is, always file a provisional patent, at least in the United States. Now we've just switched the process here in the United States um, to actually this first to file. Hasn't been implemented yet, won't be implemented for another 18 months. But as opposed to first to invent, it will be first to file like it is in the rest of the world. So always take the opportunity to file. Okay? If you think it's worthwhile, file it then. It doesn't take much to actually file intellectual property, file it. But then what I'd like you to do is take that next step and file it away. You put it over here and then take a step back, which takes a tremendous amount of discipline and ask yourself, okay, what is the problem I'm going after? And that particular problem, what are the details related to that problem? And I bet you're going to find that in the end of the day, that invention may be interesting, but there'll be iterative things about it that are better by understanding the clinical need. And in fact, the invention may not even be applicable anymore. There'll be iterative steps of new inventions that are more important because you took a close look at the clinical need. So when I say the word clinical need, this is a terminology we use a lot at Stanford. It really involves two major big buckets, the clinical problem and the outcome. Okay? So let's talk about how to put these two things together. The outcome is something I'm not satisfied, or the market's not satisfied, or patients are not satisfied. So what, what do I want to change? What do I want to create? And problems are usually best identified through observation. So this is a rare process, but most of you uh, who are physicians or have access to clinical care have something that, that most people don't, and that is that they have the access to the hospital. They have the access to, the, to, to the patient care, and they can see and speak to patients or to physicians about what the real problems they experience. We'll come up with a second, I'll show you some pictures of observation. The key is this, 
If you see in the observation process physicians struggling, <laughs> frustrated, throwing things, that's a problem, but it's also an opportunity. Okay? There is an opportunity that the care being provided is, needs to be done differently. The physician needs to be more comfortable with what he's doing, or it's taking too long, or it isn't working the way that they'd like it to. So although we've all probably been through my medical training and, and some of my colleagues, unfortunately, been in a cath lab or an OR where people are throwing stuff, um, take that opportunity and ask yourself, not run for the room, outside the room, but what, what's going on and what's the opportunity that can create in a different way? The outcome is something very objective. And I think this is one of the most important lessons I'm going to try and pass on today, is that you have to be able to measure what you're doing in an objective way. If I want to change something, I want to change the outcome, if it's not measurable, it's going to be real tough to take it forward. And I'll provide you some context for that in a few minutes. So if I combine the problem and the outcome into what I call the clinical need, in the end, what I'm going to try and do is drive what we use is what we call need statements, these single sentences that provide the central DNA of a, of a project. They can live for the next week or day, or they can live for the next 10 years. And then we say that they're the central DNA of a project as it moves forward. And I'll describe and give you a couple examples in a few minutes. And we're going to start with what we call a prototype need statement, just throwing something down on paper, and we're going to modify it over time. So, Observation. Again, most people have this idea that clinical problems and great opportunities exist here in the operating room and, or the cath lab, and a lot of them do. But these are the patients that are often that are being met. And what we're looking for also is unmet clinical needs. Okay? Those are the ones that patients who can't go to the cath lab, can't go to the operating room. And so the unmet clinical need is often on patients you'll see in clinic. Patients who actually are not candidates, and a large majority of patients are actually not candidates for therapies today. If you look at anything from, uh, you ask the initial days of cardio, uh, cardiac angioplasty, and this is a true story of a group that was doing diligence on John Simpson's original project, balloon angioplasty, and you had this idea, they said, who should we talk to about whether people being treated with coronary artery disease need to have this new balloon technology to actually treat, treat the blockages? Who do you think they asked? They asked cardiac surgeons, and what did they say? There's no need for such technology. Two and a half years later, they went back. It took two and a half years delayed for that exact example why angioplasty didn't take off initially. Were there patients that were then not being treated? So they went back two and a half years later and said, well, I know you didn't think this was a great idea for patients who were getting bypass surgery, but what if patients actually aren't candidates for bypass surgery? Do you think we could treat them a different way? And they said, oh, of course. Most patients we can't treat with bypass surgery. So how you ask the question has a lot to do with the answer is. And so we want to look at patients actually before care, during care, and actually there's a lot of great opportunities in post-care. The ICU, post-op, recovery, rehabilitation, there's some great opportunities out there for innovation. So don't just think about observation and clinical problems about people in the operating room, the cath lab. You've got to think about the patient. You've got to think about what the process is. And I'm sure everyone here, and unfortunately I'm assuming most people here, have been a patient sometime. I was recently a patient at Stanford Hospital. That is not something you want to go through. If you have to work there every day, you realize what it is like to experience care on the other side. It is a bureaucracy that is very scary, very uncomfortable, and very bureaucratic. And so experience what it's like to be the patient, and you'll find that there are many opportunities out there for innovation. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how you take this observation. We're going to define what the problem is this thing that we're unhappy with, we're gonna connect it to an outcome and we're gonna draft a need statement. This is the same diligence, the same amount of time you spend on product design. And everyone seems to be that it's no big deal to spend all this time writing things out and design specs. You're gonna apply the same discipline to the process when it comes to the clinical need. And we're gonna create this thing called a need statement. So when I was giving you examples of outcomes, okay, these are the ways I'm just gonna ask myself, do I have a chance of actually changing outcome? So, if I want to target, for instance, improved uh, clinical efficacy, how am I going to do it? If I can't measure it and evaluate it at the end of the day, I shouldn't be doing the project. And that's going to be usually defined by treatment success in a clinical trial. So the first thing I do when I look and I ask my fellows when I'm looking at a project and someone said, I have this cool thing, this invention, this idea, is they take a step back and say, what would the clinical trial look like to prove success? I design in my mind the clinical trial from the very outset, early. And if I can't actually evaluate the clinical trial and I can't prove it, because that is part of the regulatory process, but it's not just the regulatory process, it's the reimbursement process, and more importantly, it's the adoption process. 
There is a cemetery of technologies that were developed that are FDA approved and in fact actually have CE mark and have reimbursement that are not used today. What does that prove to you? It's about the customer. So just because you can spend all this time and money moving through the process and get the regulatory approval, which is difficult in itself, reimbursement, which is even today even harder to get covered, doesn't mean that physicians will actually use the technology. And again, a cemetery of technologies all over the place that, that kind of meet that criteria. So ask yourself, how is it going to be used and how am I going to evaluate it? And what does that look like? If I ask myself, well, this particular problem has a 2% complication rate. And I'm going to reduce it by 50%, which is pretty remarkable, and take it down to 1%. Does that matter? Does it matter clinically? It may matter statistically. And it's very difficult when you come from the engineering side to matter, but you have to ask yourself, and more importantly, you have to ask clinicians, at the end of the day, is it clinically meaningful? Taking a complication take from 2% to 1%, is that clinic clinically meaningful? And it may be, depends on how many cases are done. But then ask yourself the next question. How many patients in the clinical trial will it take to prove that? Probably 1,000, 1,500 for such a complication rate, maybe more. If that's the case and it's expensive implant and technology, how much capital will it take to get me there? The point of this is you need to understand from the outset, based on the clinical problem, not my invention, what it's going to take to prove it out. If I want increased patient safety, I'm going to look at the rate of adverse events, that complication rate. If I want reduced costs, I'm going to look at the total cost of the procedure relative to available alternatives. If I want improved physician productivity, it's the time and resources. These are all very meaningful and all very measurable. If I want physician ease, it's the solution of complex workarounds. If I want improved patient convenience, it's the frequency and occurrence of required treatments, the change in the venue, a great opportunity. Taking something from the surgical suite into the cath lab, something from the cath lab to the bedside, great way to reduce costs. If I want accelerated patient recovery, one of the most important endpoints today is length of stay. How much time in the overhead of the healthcare system, that is a very objective, measurable endpoint. And so I want to ask myself, okay, can I hit one of those endpoints and what's the endpoint I'm going to be at the beginning? And you say, but I just have this idea, it's in my notebook. I know. But if you want to ask yourself whether it's worth putting the credit card down and spending a good part of your life moving this forward, ask yourself over here, is it worthwhile and can I prove it from the very beginning? So these need statements, these are the isolate the single need that has the best chance of addressing the problem, driving a desired outcome, and supporting a reasonable market opportunity. There's a guy that works with us at Stanford named Ross Jaffe. He is, uh, now was on Fortune Magazine as the biggest medical uh, venture capitalist in the world this last year. And he said the most important principle that physicians and engineers don't get is that we all have the intent, he's actually a physician, to get technology to patients. But if you can't build a business around it, it does not matter. Okay, let me say that again. If you can't build a business around it, it doesn't matter. The business is the vehicle to get technology to patients. It is not the source, it's not the goal. If your goal is to build a company, I think you're in the wrong business, at least you're in the wrong room, okay? The goal should be to get stuff to patients. The company, that's the way to get there. It's a way to actually satisfy investors, to develop technology, to create things that actually get stuff to patients. This need statement, we're gonna do in one sentence. I'm gonna give you a couple examples in a second. A single sentence that clarifies and defines exactly what the clinical opportunity is. So, we're gonna start by prototyping a need statement, just putting something down on paper, okay? Then we're gonna develop a further iteration of that, a final need statement, and ultimately a need specification. Well, what is a need specification? It's no different than a design specification that probably most of you've seen or even been involved with. Very specifically lays down the details of the clinical need. And there's two important processes that'll move the entire time as you're doing this. Scoping, which is looking at the level, the, the, the area, how big the opportunity is, and validation, diligence, the same thing as investors do. Importantly, you have to take an objective eye every day, every minute you're doing this, to asking yourself, is this meaningful, and is it gonna matter, and how can I prove it? And don't be afraid to frail and put it aside and do something else. If it doesn't satisfy, the criteria you established. So here's a couple of examples of need scoping, and these are some very specific need statements. So if I'm working in the area of uh, bypass surgery, uh, and I'm thinking, well, you know, there's always this problem with these, these metal rings, these clips you see on chest x-rays, you have to tie the chest together. There's gotta be a better way to do that, right? 
It's a big problem. We have wounds to hiss from time to time. The healing's not adequate. Patients complain a lot of pain. In fact, the most common thing they complain about after bypass surgery is sternal pain. There's got to be a way to deal with that, right? It's a great clinical need. Well, I can scope my need statement at the top of the pyramid here with a way to close sternotomy quickly and securely. That'd be a very nice, well-characterized need statement. And we often start it out with the term, a way. Okay, why is that? Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if it's technical solution, biologic, chemical, anything. It's just a way to accomplish that. And the two most important criteria, objectively, are quickly defined on time, how long it takes to actually do it, and securely, the, probably the rate of dehiscence and the complications associated with that. So that's the top of the pyramid. However, if I'm always thinking about that, what are the things that come to mind? Well, I'm, maybe I could use different adhesives, maybe I can use different approaches that immediately define the invention we talked about previously. But is that really the problem? Is it really sternal pain that's the problem? I'm closing the wound, or is it a bigger issue? How about if my need statement's the thing down below it? A way to perform coronary artery bypass grafting without a sternotomy. Well, we're already at that stage, right? People are doing minimally, minimally invasive robotic approaches and stuff so they don't have sternal pain. So I don't need to close it because I never opened it. That's another approach that opens our mind to all sorts of different opportunities out there and different inventions. Or how about this one? The need statement at the bottom of the pyramid, probably the most important, most fundamental. A way to revascularize heart muscle without excess morbidity. These are the same thing, right? We're approaching, if I'm thinking about a way to actually use adhesive to actually put the sternum together, they're satisfied by all three of these different need statements, but these are scoped at a different level. And the possibilities for inventions, and by the way, the competitors that will be competing against you are all laid out at different levels. So the truth is the best need statement up here is the bottom one. You may have something that actually closes the wound a little bit better, but the best need statement is the one at the bottom. Okay, because it defines very specifically everything that's out there that's associated with the problem, associated with sternal pain after bypass surgery. So here's the key to the, the four areas that I call the four tenets or four pillars of clinical need evaluation. And this is what investors will do when they're evaluating not just your intellectual property and not just your team, but these four important areas. The first one is the disease state fundamentals. What disease you're going after, what's the epidemiology, what's the biology of it, and how does it work, okay? So upper left, really important to understand. And you have to become an expert, just like the clinical people in that area. You have to speak the language, you have to understand the terminology, you have to go to the meetings, you have to really dig in and become a specialist in that very, very specific area. Medicine is extremely broad, very complicated, but you're very capable of digging into a very specific sector and going very deep in that area with your resources, and you really have to understand that area. I will tell you that one of the most important aspects of understanding disease state is understanding the mechanism of the disease. If you do not understand what the mechanism of the disease, if no one understands what the mechanism of the disease, and there's lots of examples out there, it's gonna to be tough to work in this space. There are lots of technologies that work on particular diseases, but if you understand the mechanism, it gives you lots of places to have action, lots of different ways. And just because you get a result, just because your technology or solution works, one of the most important things physicians will ask is, we don't really understand how it works though, so I'm, I'm not sure that we're gonna do it, okay? Even if you have an outcome. And I will tell you that companies and investors will ask the same thing, how are you sure? Because you will not know the clinical results till years later on a new technology. So knowing the mechanism reduces the risk and increases the chance for success. Up on the upper right is the market evaluation. And this sometimes makes physicians and engineers very uncomfortable. Market, ooh, that's money. Well, what I'm really talking about is money, but I'm also talking about the number of patients. And again, it's not the patients that are currently being treated. I look at hundreds of business plans every year. And the biggest mistake made is this. Everyone overestimates what the opportunity is based on the number of patients currently being treated. They say, well, there's this 500,000 bypass surgeries, there's 2 million uh, stent procedures, so there's 2.5 million cases being done, so my new technology is gonna come up, and I think uh, Dr. Durfee highlighted this. So my business plan is year one, I'm gonna have 1.25 million cases, and by year two, I'm gonna take care of everybody, okay? That may be true. You may have this completely remarkable technology that takes over, but it's gonna take longer to be adopted. And more importantly, it's not just the patients currently being treated. It's the patients that aren't being treated. So you've got to understand the difference between the disease, the patients who are possibly being treated, and it can be treated a different way, and patients in the adoption rate of technology, people converting from an existing method to a new method. And you've got to think about the dollars associated with that. 
And again, this makes most engineers and physicians uncomfortable when it starts talking about money. But again, if this perspective is that money investors is the way to get to patient care, I think it's a little easier to, to, to understand and to actually deal with. The bottom left is the existing technologies. You have to understand what everyone else is doing, okay? What are the existing technologies that are out there? And they're not just the medical devices you're competing against. You have to understand what pharma is doing, biologics, and often what preventative care is doing at that time. Because if you're working on a new therapy for a particular disease, and that disease can be treated better but through prevention eventually, your market's gonna go down. And your competitors are everyone that plays in that space. So it's not just the existing, it's the emerging technologies, places like here, which is one of the hotbeds of med tech. What are people doing in emerging technologies, the companies that are coming out right now? And this is when you might want to go looking at intellectual property of what other people are doing. In the process of brainstorming, one of my favorite things to do and one of the things I teach all the time is what I call landscaping the area of particular, particular area of need. What are the different ways that I can approach the problem? What's the mechanical, chemical, biologic, uh, pharmacologic, a number of different ways that I can approach the problem. Why? You have to understand what your approach is, but more importantly, you have to understand what other people's approach is and how they're going to compete with you. So if I've landscaped the field really, really well, then I'm going to go look and see what other people are doing and actually make a decision again. Do I want to spend my time taking my technology forward? The bottom right is probably the most difficult thing to describe and probably the most uh, important. It's called stakeholder evaluation. So at the end of the day, who do you think defines whether technology gets taken up? And you'd say, well, physicians, right? We're the ones that use it. I'd love to tell you you're right, but I will tell you that at least where I am, physicians do not run Stanford Medical Center. Nurses do, okay? They run everything about that hospital. We're just visitors there, and they tell us that all the time. So the important thing is nurses, physicians, insurance company, payers, they define who and what technology gets taken up. And so you're no longer just asking physicians. You need to go ask the customer, and more importantly, you need to go ask nurses about how patients are taken care of, because they really know. There's a, some great examples of technology. I'll call you one about a closure device. One of the most interesting things about closure devices, what someone said about holding the groin before, was that if you hold the groin, what's the goal? Is the goal actually to stop bleeding, or is it to close the artery, or is the goal to actually have the patient ambulate? Important question, right? Well, the issue actually for costs and for patients is how quick can you ambulate and get out of the hospital? It's not whether the artery is closed or not. And a number of these closure devices are really good at closing the artery, but they're not really good at reducing oozing from the groin site. We've done a couple of clinical trials at Stanford where we put the device in, we're confident the artery is closed, and we send the patient to the unit, and for the next six to eight hours, the nurses call us and we say, send the patient home, and they say, nope, patient's still oozing. Still, what the artery is closed, yeah, but the track created by the device has now got the patient uncomfortable, and the nurses aren't comfortable sending them home. Those technologies will not be taken up, even though the artery is closed. Okay, so what is the fundamental need that needs to be satisfied? Is it arterial closure, or is it time to ambulation? And in the cost structure today, it's time to ambulation with safety. So the need statement defines very different possibilities in what's going to be successful. So when we're looking at need evaluation, we need to think about the customer. We need to think about, at the beginning, defining that need. Spend time with the customer. Ask them questions. Anybody can get to. It's not hard to walk into you and start asking nurses a bunch of questions. Um, become an expert in their problems and observe the problem in different settings. It isn't just in the hospital. It's outside the hospital and post-operative care. Confirm the need assessment. Interview key opinion leaders. Review the literature. This is one big important thing I want to highlight, the literature. Everyone loves to think that the most important thing is to go test their device, their invention, to build it and test it, and I don't want to underestimate the value of that. But I say, why should you spend time on animal studies and work when someone's already done it for you before? Something that gets missed all the time is no one takes the time to do a deep dive into what we call clinical predicates. How many people are familiar with Ardian? Raise your hand if you're familiar with Ardian, that hypertension technology that's treating ablation. Okay. Why do you think that that was successful? Because Mark Deem, the founder, found a clinical paper from 1941 talking about sympathectomy and how you could actually cut the nerves. That work had already been done. That was the clinical predicate. No one would have ever funded that company in a million years if they didn't have a clinical predicate because they, they couldn't create the same thing in animal models. 
So going and looking into literature and digging into not what comes up quickly, but digging into the archives of clinical medicine, you will find a lot of things that will be done before that will give you an idea whether this thing will possibly work. So go find it, spend the time, spend the few days it takes, as opposed to the huge amount of dollars it takes doing animal testing. I do a ton of animal work. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's very expensive. I think you all know that animal work is more expensive than clinical work is. It costs more money, and it takes a lot of time. So if someone's already done it, don't do it yet. Find out whether the feasibility of the project is worthwhile. The screening and prioritization process comes along with needs according to risk, both the technical, this was mentioned before, the clinical regulatory and reimbursement, and the opportunity, the market size, and define the customer criteria by what we call a need specification a statement of the need that defines the background of the clinical problem and market, the evidence supporting the need, and a description of the customer criteria. One important principle, I think I touched on this, is what we call superseding needs. Remember, you're going to be competing against everyone else that's out there, not just other devices, but other technologies. So, atrial fibrillation, okay? Lots of different ways to treat it. If we're talking about stroke prevention, thromboembolic stroke, um, as it comes to uh, excuse me, atrial fibrillation, there's a number of different ways I can do that. I can anticoagulate the patient, or I can actually put these devices in the left atrium, okay? If I want, instead want to just get them out of atrial fibrillation, I can use ablation, I can use cardioversion, I don't have the problem stroke. So shocking the patient out of atrial fibrillation solves the stroke problem as well. So does antiarrhythmic medications, and so does ablation. These are competitive technologies that compete against each other. And so the important thing is how do they compete against each other? If I'm out there in trouble and ball protection using a device that goes in the left atrium, I'd better be familiar with the rate of uptake of ablation is, because ablation is going to reduce the size of my market. Okay? They are actually co closer to the core, closer to the tree, and they are a superseding need. And importantly, if I run through the biodesign pathway, the idea is to create lots of different needs I'm looking at and look at lots of different particular concepts and potential solutions. So on failing, an inventor is always failing. He tries and fails maybe a thousand times. If he succeeds once, then he is in. Okay? The key is fail fast. Iterate many, many times. Look at lots of clinical problems. Look at lots of different opportunities for your technology, your idea, or if you're looking at it from the needs-driven side, pair one disease versus another. It is the opportunity cost for you of working on one side of the equation versus working on the other. Okay? Don't be afraid to fail, and I mean that. I have failed many, many times. I encourage our fellows and people I work with to fail a lot. I don't mean big failures, I mean small failures. Try something, see if it works, if it doesn't work, it move on. Prototype it one way, it doesn't work, prototype it another way. It's the same thing's true on the need side. Market analysis doesn't make sense, do it again, get more data, okay? F don't be afraid to fail, but make sure you use an objective eye to failure, and make sure you do it over and over. So a couple, just to wrap up a couple of three different concepts. The validation process and verify the needs, the Z state, the market, the emergent technologies, and the stakeholders. Validate your concept, okay? Talk to people. Ask them whether they think it's worthwhile, or if they can actually make sense, and then prototype it. And assess the pathway with intellectual property, regulatory, reimbursement, and business models, okay? These are things you're going to hear much more about today, and my piece of this process is just the front end. In the feasibility assessment, though, if you're going to assess feasibility, the important thing is what is the most important thing that's going to kill the project as quickly as possible? Everyone always thinks that this is the timeline to development and you're always afraid to not test something you don't want to hear about because it's going to fail the project. If you're so convinced, if you're drinking your own Kool-Aid that the project's that important, you'll be afraid to actually find how it fails. Important question. Whatever the most fundamental component of this, the fastest way to fail, test that first. Doesn't necessarily need the most important question, but what's the thing that's going to kill the project? That's feasibility, and it's an important aspect of assessing your actual pro prototype and assessing your project. And then early prototyping and acute animal studies are important aspects. You want to address fundamental questions and establish milestones for investors. And you want to build value and reduce risk. And then when it talks about implementation, these are some of the most important aspects of what we talk about defining implementation. Financial modeling, funds forecasting, research strategy, how am I going to do the development of my R&D process, marketing, clinical regulatory, the project management and that thing called business that's come sometimes uncomfortable, but very, very important that you speak the language and put this into terms that investors can understand. 
as uh, Haim actually mentioned, we've written a textbook related to this 27 different steps of this process. This textbook uh, actually hopefully highlights, and we did this as a purpose. This came out of our courses. We all wrote, six of us wrote it together, and actually laid this down as hopefully a way of all the failures we've had along the way to try and help others in moving through that process. So the summary is that great projects start with a thorough evaluation of the clinical need and the opportunity, and the biodesign process describes need-driven innovation. However, if you have a great idea, don't be afraid to fail. Um, spend the time validating your project and assessing its long-term viability by actually going back and validating it with the clinical need. So with that, thank you very much.